listeners. Welcome to Grief Out Loud. Remember the last time you tried to talk about grief and suddenly everybody left the room? Grief Out Loud is opening up this often avoided conversation because grief is hard enough without having to go through it alone. We bring you a mix of personal stories, tips for supporting children, teens, and yourself, and interviews with professionals in the grief world. Platitude and cliche-free, we promise. Grief Out Loud is hosted by me, Jana DeCristofero, and produced by Dougie Center, the National Grief Center for Children and Families in Portland, Oregon. Imagine if in your grief, there was a place you could go where you could be both broken and perfect at the exact same time. A place where you could be around other broken and perfect people who are also grieving. Maybe you would talk, Maybe you would scream. Maybe you'd weed a garden and feed a chicken while screaming or talking, or not. A place like this was the dream and invention of Laura Green and Sasha Demersion, two friends who during the early days of the pandemic started to imagine a place just like this, a place that would eventually become the grief house. Now, there is actually a grief house, like with walls and a roof and a yard. It's in Portland, Oregon. And it's the house that belonged to Laura's mother, Grace, who died in the summer of 2023. But the grief house also exists outside of those walls, with gatherings and offerings both in the virtual sphere and in Atlanta, Georgia. In this conversation, I got to talk with Laura, one of the co-founders, and we got into so many things, including the fear of death that she's had as long as she can remember, the fear that everyone and everything she cared about would be taken from her especially her mother. We also talk about her mom, Grace, and the magical creature that she was on this planet. A big part of Laura's grief is the story of her mother's death, of finding her in the yard of the grief house and spending time with her body. So we talk about that too. I love connecting with people who are creating ways to be with grief that exist outside the bounds of more traditional things like therapy and support groups. Traditional stuff is great. I mean, it's what I do at Dougie Center by facilitating peer grief support groups. And there are so many other ways for us to be in and with our grief, especially in the community of others who are going through it too. So here's my conversation with Laura talking all about all of it. Laura, thanks for joining me for this conversation today. Ah, Thanks for having me. I know we're going to talk a lot about your mom, but I wanted to just start with What's your sense of something that's feeling really supportive to you in your grief right now? Mm. I don't know if this is, I think this is a thing that I'm going to say. It's it's more like a thing I'm, I have a really lot of hope for. for. I, I've been wanting to work with clay for a long, for a while. I had this idea that I needed to get like a wheel and I, and like a lot of stuff to set it up. And then I was like, well, maybe I don't, maybe I could just build stuff by hand, but still I need to go get clay and I need to, and the, this lovely woman who was working with the project showed up the other day with like a cardboard box full of clay. She was like, I'm cleaning out my clay studio and I have this box. I want to give it away. And I don't know if you guys could use it. And so like the other, yesterday I sat in the basement. I made this little space after my mom died in the house that I was like, this is going to be my space. And like, I have our kitchen table from when I was little in it. And I put out, you know, like a clothy, scrubby up tablecloth on the table and like made a little clay thing. And it felt really good. It felt really good to like take a second and be doing something quietly that wasn't for, it isn't not for anyone. Like I can feel that it has a a thing that it wants to do, but it's like, I'm going to do the thing that it wants to do and then hand it out. I I don't know. It felt lovely. And I have that feeling in other spots, but in this exact moment, that's the spot that feels where I I feel like I have like a, like an in, you know, I'm like, oh, I'm going to go downstairs, like maybe even after this. Yeah. And sit with the clay and see what it wants to do. So I think that, I think the clay right now. It's interesting because it sounds like it's something that's sort of new to you. And when I think about clay, clay is all about taking shape and taking form. And you're in that place of like, this is taking shape and taking form for me of potentially being a supportive outlet for my grief. 
Yeah, that that's interesting. I hadn't thought about it like that, but that does feel right. And then I also I have been thinking about how it's like it's actually the earth. Like it it's been mined. I mean, this clay in a way that I think is really disruptive and probably unsupportable. I don't know in particular with this clay, but like like I'm holding the actual earth, you know? It's like actually earth. And that feels interesting. Earth that's been kind of pulled away from its source. And to think about how to do that in a way that is good and feels good to me and to and like to it, like that feels good is interesting and and useful for me right now. Seems like the perfect lead in being pulled away from source to talk about your mom yeah. and your who your mom was as maybe part of the source of you and yeah. And, and being pulled away from her when she died. And so what what should we know about your mom? Mm. <sighs> um, I, I got really, really, really lucky with my mom. I feel like um, she was the perfect mother for me, and I don't think it's easy to bump into people like her. You know, she was a person who really just got born quite connected to, I don't know what you want to call it, like God and magic and like that. The For her, she was raised Catholic. She was a nun for 20 years before she had me. Catholicism like held her spiritual connection to the big everything um, without breaking it like it like her connection to sort of fill the space of Catholicism was allowed to like move around in the world wearing this like cloak of Catholicism that was acknowledged and, and accepted and 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 it grew and grew and then she had me sort of out of that like she didn't break with divinity to have me she got she like moved deeper and deeper into it and and had me inside it and then raised me inside it and I just don't know who else I think that it used to be how everyone was raised, you know, before we became, before like modern agriculture and industrialization is like inside of this system that much, was much bigger than us and sentient and in love with us. And, and, I, and I think it's less common, but that is how I got, how I got raised, which is like, for me, like a kind of a miracle or feels kind of like a, a gift, feels like a tremendous gift. And and so it's been really interesting. I and I was really terrified of her death. She was my my only parent. My only I mean my father was a, didn't raise me, um, and I was always really afraid that she would die because it it felt. I remember being really little and thinking, if my mother dies and I am okay, if I am ever able to survive my mother's death, that means God does not exist. There cannot be like I couldn't imagine a world where I could withstand separation from her. The end to her felt like the end to all of magic. So it's been really interesting having her body die. And, you know, after dreading it for 48 years, having it show actually show up and be really different than I feared. How how has it been different than how you feared it? I mean, you, you it sounds like you anticipated it being the end of all and everything. Yeah, I did. It's been not the end of all and everything at all. And I should have known, you know, now in retrospect, I'm like, of of course, like, of course. But at the time, I just couldn't believe in it. But just like everything else, her death process was exactly right. Like the whole way along, like not that it wasn't incredibly painful, but it felt like each step of it was like the next, like this next thing that I needed in and like, I don't feel far from her now. And in some ways I feel closer to her now that she doesn't have to be inside the body she was in at the, at the end, which was a really hard body for her to be in um, at the end. Like she was done being in our body and it feels just much easier to, to, for us to play together now. That's a sort of broad overview of how it feels. Is there an example you might give? Because I'm thinking of people listening and being like, what does it mean to be in a, you know, in a relationship of play with someone who has died? Is there an example of, of how that might show up in your day-to-day life? 
Well, when my mother was alive, she was really joyful and um, she really delighted in me. Like she wanted me to be brave and she, and she liked that I was, and she was, I would be like, can I do this impossible thing? Like, can I climb to the top of that like jagged cliff? And she'd be like, I think so. <laughs> and I would try and she would like laugh. Like she would, I think I have so many memories of her telling me I should go ahead and do something. And then hearing her talking with like an aunt or another adult and about how crazy it was that I was doing the thing that she just told me I like to, should do. And I know that was one of the things that she loved about us, that she loved about herself and that she loved that I, I mean, she was like that. She, you know, she did all the, she was so brave. She was the bravest person. And like when she died, she died here in the yard and I came to the house. I thought she was alive. Like, you know, I talked to her a few hours before, like I came through the house and she wasn't in the house and I was surprised that she wasn't in the house. And like every time I came in the house and she wasn't in the house, I had a little bit of dread, um, you know, in the last months. But I like went through the house calling to her and went out the back door and saw her laying on the ground and knew like instantly that she was that she was dead. And so then I had like then I had a bunch of time because there was nobody else around. Like, she, you know, it was her house and it was just me there. I like called my partner and she and our other family member, Erica, were going to come. We're like, we're, we'll come. Um, but they were going to be an hour probably. And it like little by little, I got closer to her body, closer and closer and closer to her body. And then when Erica and Jan got here, I, I was like able to touch her body. And when I was like sitting next to her and touching her body, I just had this like very clear feeling that she was watching me and delighted. Like, yeah, touch it. Like it's, yeah, isn't that so strange that I'm dead? You know, like feel what it feels like. And I could imagine her like, like that particular look that she would give me that she, that I got from her all the time where she was like watching me, like watching me do something that she knew I could do, but that she was also amazed I could do proud and, and amused and like, and that maybe she wouldn't do like, I, you know, like I think she liked it that I, that I was there next to her body and I could touch it and I could like cut off her hair and like feel all the parts of her. And, and I think that that was the first moment when I was like, oh, it's like this, it feels if this, I know this feeling she's dead, but I still get the feeling from her. So play, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, it seems like a word that encompasses so much of what you said of like amusement and delight and encouragement and and faith in you, all of that wrapped into that idea of play. And like, and the, uh, you know, my mom was really good at being able to be like, it's funny, you know, like, look, we're, we're just humans doing this. Like, there's so many things that we think are a really big deal and they are, but also, it is kind of, do you know what I mean? Like, it is kind of also a game. Laura, is there a way in which the death story of your mom, of coming to her house, finding her in the yard, spending time with her body, has that played a role in your grief story as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, a huge role. And I'm, again, I'm so lucky and so grateful for that unfolding exactly how it did. I had a this dog that I loved a lot who died the summer before last. And I got to be with her body while she was dying and like hold her. And then afterwards, um, and I was really incredibly, I am incredibly grateful that I got to have her body next to my body when she was dying. And then um, she wasn't my dog. And afterwards the vet was like, okay, we're going to take her body away, but you won't want to watch this. And, you know, it wasn't my place to say if we would or we wouldn't anyway, but also I felt afraid and we left. And as soon as we left, I was like, no, that was a wrong choice. Like I, sh I am not done with her body and now it's gone. And I, and I like made a note. I was like, this is going to be useful for you to remember when your mother dies. Like, remember, you know, like remember this, but it could have happened in a million ways where I, I might not have had the same access. You know, I think that my body needed to know, needed to know 
that her body was dead. Like my body and her body are literally the same body. You know, I am made from her body. I was, my body and her body are, are the same body and my body needed to know that she was dead and that, and that we were okay. You know, like, I think if my brain tried to tell my body that without it getting to feel that it was true, I don't know. I think that would have been really hard. So getting to see her and touch her. And I was also really lucky that her body was not traumatically dead. You know, there's, there's a million very like situations where it would not have been a useful or who knows, but I can say for sure that the fact that her body was her body looked like her body. She was her and dead. That was very helpful. And I got to touch her again a few days later at the funeral home. I like got to see her there and like bring things and touch her body more and wrap shroud her body. And then I got to go stand in the hole where her body got put into the ground. And I got to, before we brought her body there. And then when we brought her body there, I got to like, you know, like my cousin like dragged her body on the cart to the hole and I got to get in the hole again and catch her as they like lowered her down into the hole, like like touch her and put her in and then dig the dirt back on her. And now I get to go visit her there and I can watch her mound getting flatter, you know? It's it's very help. I don't think every single body needs it, but my body has really needed it, has really needed to know. I mean, it was always with her. It was one of the things, like if she got hurt or she, like she always wanted me to touch the stuff. If I got hurt, like that was, that was like, it was always really important to me. And um, she really did a good job of supporting me and letting me like get really close to the stuff that scared me and, and like touch it in every way I could. So, yeah, I think it's been incredibly the exact way that she died and my ability to be with her, her body so much has had, has been incredibly helpful for me. You have me thinking about the part of grief that can be so painful. Well, lots of parts of grief can be painful, but this idea of how it's the surreal nature of it, this can't Mm -hmm. be true or did this really happen or this can't be true. And it seems like from what you're saying, you really like on a cellular level engaged with Mm. that physical separation. Yeah. And I still get to be in our house. You know, I got to come back and I, we moved a lot growing up and, um, we always rented. And so I can't go back to my childhood houses. And I can't tell you how big of a deal it is to me that I got to, I get to be in her house. I'm in her house now. You know, she was in this house. I got to, I've gotten to like transform it. Like a new person's going to sleep in her room soon. And I know who she is. And I like painted the walls and I cleaned out the furniture. And I, she knew my mother before my mother died. Like, for me, this is very helpful that I'm not out of the story. I haven't been like pushed out of the story. I'm like in the story of her. The tunnel is the same tunnel. Like her cat and her chicken are here and they were there when like looking at her dead body with me that day. Like we've all, we're all inside of the story as it like, you know, let's say like dig our way through One thing I'm thinking about, Laura, is people listening right now might think, wow, she's so evolved in this grief. She like spent so much time with her mom's body and she's in the house and it it sounds very um, lovely. And then wondering, Mm -hmm. like, is there the part of grief that people more stereotypically associate with that experience? Um, You know, my mom died for years. Like it was, it was probably two years of her body that were really marked where she could just do less and less and less. And that was so painful. And I was so panicked for all of those two years. And I was coming here every day and I was trying to make her body stop hurting, but she was undiagnosed. There was no particular thing going on that we knew about. And I was like cleaning up poop and so much pee and, you know, taking showers with her and panicked and mean. I was not, um, 
I'm not soft when I'm scared. I'm like tight and hard when I'm scared. I'm quick and busy. And I was quick and busy and not soft and fighty. And she was fighty and we were, and we were fighty with each other. And, um, I hated it. Like I just, I hated that she was, I hated the whole, I didn't like it. And I knew, you know, I do this, I run a grief house. So I'm like, try, try, you know, really try, which is helpful for me. It's helpful that I know that I tried, that I was like, that was actually my best. And I did the things, you know, I like, I met the needs, but I met it like me right now, which is, you know, wasn't super beautiful. It was helpful to have other people around because if there were other people looking, I could be a little bit, I could like be whatever, like a little bit better. You know, I could be like, hold up. <laughs> like, is that really what you want to show? You're like, do you want to come out right out with, could you temper that at all? Yeah, it was so hard. It was so hard. It was so hard. It was so much adrenaline. It was just adrenaline all the time, all the time. Like every time my phone rang, it was just like spikes of adrenaline. Driving here, you know, when she wouldn't answer the phone, like it was so much adrenaline. Since she has died, it's not been like my partner's mother died recently and she's had much more grief like you think of in a television show, you know. I I didn't. I haven't. Like it's been different for me. It's been really different for me. And and sometimes I feel worried about it. Sometimes I'm like, but why aren't I? Should I be like, what is wrong? Am I, am I not? I can't, cause I can go f- fast and skip over things and I worry sometimes. So that's possible. I dream about her like every night or like she's in my dreams every night. And that's nice. And you know, and it's it's been some how many months has it been since August? <laughs> Six months. So who knows? Maybe there'll be another wave. Like maybe August will come and I'll I don't know. I don't know what will come next, but I don't know. I'm really glad that I get to go. I don't know. I'm really glad I got to put her in the ground someplace where I get to go and and visit her. Yeah. You've mentioned a couple of times your project, your program, the grief house. So I wonder if you could share a little bit about kind of like the origin of that. And I'm just thinking about you've been in the, in the realm of bearing witness to other people's grief and then to have your own personal experience with grief and to make space for it to just be how it, how it is exactly how it is, you know, and not like, Oh, it has to look like this or that. But yeah, tell us a little bit about kind of the origin of, of grief house. Well, you know, I've been scared of death, really scared of death since I was a child. Like as a little child, scared in a way that was occasionally debilitating. I've I've like worked on it in a bunch of different ways. And in 2015, my aunt, my aunt died, my aunt Norma, who was my mother's, my aunt Ruth died previously, but she was a per- first person to die. But then Norma died in March. And then in December, my cousin's son uh, died by suicide. He was 22. I could be wrong about his age. And then there was just like cats died and another cousin had the giant tube. It was like the thing and then another thing and another thing, another thing. And I really couldn't get my feet. And because I'm a do, you know, and I'm a doer, I like talking. I like talking, but it doesn't fix it for me in the way that I think it does for some people. My body wants to be involved. And I just wanted a place where I could be sad, but not have to explain myself. Like I wanted a place where I could be sad and just like spackling the hole in the wall and and not have to be avoiding it, but also not have to be like I, I like a I like a grief circle. We do like grief spills and I like those. I don't like small talk and I don't like I don't really like unstructured group talking. So a lot of the models for grief support didn't feel great. Didn't feel like exactly right for me. And I just thought what, like, I would just like some kind of community center, like where I was just like, I don't know, I don't like to play basketball, but if I did like to play basketball, (laughs) I want to just feel like playing basketball, you know, but just not lying, you know, not, not being like, I'm fine being like, I'm a disaster, but I'm not like, (laughs) 
I'm not pretending I'm not, but it's also not the the like only thing in the room. And then more things happened in life. Life was hard, but in 20 and I, but I decided to start the project in a anyway, and then pandemic. And then I didn't have a job for, you know, cause I do massage. Um, and so I couldn't work for however long that shutdown was. And Sasha, and that was when Sasha was like, she was, she was at that point in Chicago, but it's like, well, since we can't actually be together working on the project, why don't we just, it doesn't matter. Cause we can't, even if you were here, we couldn't. So that was when we, we started just like building it. And Sasha, Sasha and I went to high school together and lived together in high school. And um, I love her so much. And we're really, really, she's really, really good at just being like, let's just make it like, let's work as hard as we can and spend a ton of time and like not do other jobs. And, and maybe no one on earth will ever come over. And it, that's fine. Like, it's so hard to find someone who's willing to, it's like Sasha will build an elaborate fort in the woods with you, with me and not need anybody to come ever see it, you know? And I love that about her. And so that's kind of what it felt like. It was like, I find found someone who was like, yeah, I'll spend a lot of time building this fort with you that very likely no one will ever visit. Let's start now. <laughs> so Sasha, your co-founder was in Chicago, you're in Portland, and you're actually creating the grief house in Portland. Yeah, the physical house in Portland. Yeah, but we do we have a podcast and we have a website and we do virtual stuff. Um, and now she's starting, she then moved to Atlanta. And now she's starting to have things in Atlanta as well. But yeah, I, the physical house it is in, in Portland, and my my mom my mom's house. So, what are some of the offerings that you all have provided over the years? Um, so, my friend Stacy, who owns who runs Side Yard Farm, um, was doing lost table dinners um, that she'd started years before, which were just dinners for people who had lost uh, lost someone to death, and they were open, just people could talk and share food. And she was overwhelmed and asked if we would take take them over. And so we did. And I changed the structure because I'm like a wildly introverted creature who doesn't, I'm like, that sounds terrible. We would just talk. <laughs> like, no, <laughs> no. So we do it differently. Now we do a grief spill, which is a thing Sasha and I started during pandemic, where we just had this idea that like, in nature, when something dies or is lost, it is instantly taken up as food. Like there is no, even on a tree, it'll die standing and things are eating it before before anything hits the ground. And humans are nature, so that has to be true about us. But we treat our loss as like shameful and and sort of like disease carrying. And we wrap it up and we in bags and toss it into alleys. And, and that actually seems like it's causing more harm than good. On the other hand, we don't have a system where we can just toss our dead things in the street and wait for decomposers to come. It's like, it's all paved. So how do we start? So we thought, well, what if we just start by starting? Um, so we just, so the grief spill, we just go around and everybody gets to spill out whatever they have and imagine it as an offering and the other people get to take up whatever they, whatever is there for them, like whatever's food for them. Um, but we don't comment and we don't, it's like just you go around and then if we have time, we go around a second time. And it's, I like it a lot. And it, and we opened it up to um, grief from all kinds of loss, not limited to death. So we do those once a month at Side Yard in the summer and at the house in the winter. But also like we, my friend Jenny, who runs Wapato Island Farm, um, has let us go there and do grief carnivals in the summer. We've done two grief carnivals, which are so great. They're like tents set up with people doing all different offerings and you get to like walk around and there's like, um, my friend does, Tina does dream work and um, tarot, like Oracle cards and dancing. And I did wrestling for complicated people, which was the best. You say wrestling? It's so good. It's so good. It's hard to get takers, but it's a, it's great. It's like, I'll just hold you, you know, like we'll sit on the ground and I'll hold you in a position. And then you get to like, we set a timer and then you get to try to wrestle yourself free. And I, and if you break free, then I'll, we can reset. <sighs> Feels like, uh, you know, getting to have your body like in the thing. And 
the the way we're doing it at the house is for many of our events, we're collaborating with people in Portland who are already doing super cool things because that was another big idea about the the project is like there are people doing super cool things all over the place and we just have trouble finding each other because what you hear about are the tragedy because fear is um motivating and and i i would say capitalism really loves and thrives on it and so you just don't hear about like this one lady with a little art grief art group in her basement it's not it doesn't get the attention. And when you're, for me at least, when I'm really deep in grief, it's so hard to find, pull myself up far enough to like look around and find that one lady down the street who's doing this cool thing in her garden, you know? So that's another thing about the project is we really just want to be a place where everybody who's doing cool stuff can come and be like, I have a cool thing I could offer to like four or five people and we can just know each other. I can go to your like grief yoga class that you're offering. And then you can come to my wrestling group that I'm offering. Cause you know, when you're broken in grief, you're still useful. And so for, for listeners who are like, Oh, this, this sounds interesting. This project, this grief house project, like where can people connect, plug in with what you're providing? Yeah. Um, we have Instagram and I think it's the Portland grief house. And we have a website, uh, griefhouse.org, um, that has all of our gatherings on it. Um, those, I think, are the best ways to find us. And then we have a house. It's in St. John's. And I'm here a lot of the time. Tuesdays and Thursdays, I do yoga. Um, I'd like you to come, someone, because I won't do it if you don't. <laughs> and I really want to do yoga twice a week. <laughs> Um, and we're going to start this summer. We're going to be doing a bunch of stuff in the yard and we're eager for volunteers. If there are people who are like, I wish that I had some place to dig, come dig here. We'd like it. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, griefhouse.org to see the gathering, I think backslash gatherings, you can see all the, all the things that we're doing and then Instagram I'm pretty sure it's the Portland Grief House. I don't do it. Sasha does it. Although I do put reels up on. Oh, and we have a website, which you can find on like Apple Podcasts if you do a search for Portland Grief House portals. Yeah, on the I don't Sasha does all the Instagram stuff. I occasionally put up reels and I'm like, you know, I'm almost 50 and I don't I grew up my my mother was a nun who raised me outside of modern um society. <laughs> So they're like, you know, they're like old person reels where I'm like, <laughs> the camera's either like this far away from my face or like way over here and I'm not in frame at all. So you can enjoy those. <laughs> well, listeners, I know you're going to want to check out those reels. So I'm going to put links to all of that in the show notes. Um, and remember again that, you know, there's Portland location for Grief House. But as Laura mentioned, there's the podcast portals to connect and also some online virtual gatherings. And then it sounds like there's going to be some things available in Atlanta. Yeah. And we're hoping soon have land. And I mean, it's and we're growing and changing all the time. So stay. So like, yeah, come keep up with those reels. Come be with us. Yeah, (laughs) I will. (laughs) Well, Laura, thank you so much for yeah, really like tuning in to say what needed to be said today. I'm like grateful for your time and your connection in that. I'm super happy to have talked to you. It was really lovely. And listeners out there, I know you're tired of hearing this, but thank you for being part of the show, for making it mean something, for sharing episodes with friends and family and coworkers that you think might be interested or supported in some way by what we're talking about here. If you want to, you can reach out to me directly at griefoutloud at dougie.org. That's D-O-U-G-Y dot O-R-G. That's also the main website where you can find information about Dougie Center's local programming, all of our free downloadable resources in each and every episode of Grief Out Loud. And I'm excited as always to share that our podcast is sponsored in part by the Chester Stefan Endowment Fund. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us again next time.